you know, typically I'm not a superstitious person, but I regret not taking that one idiom seriously. Curiosity killed the cat. After the whole experience with the night shift, I'm kind of shaken. Apparently, Cedarville General is a hospital for myths. Apparently, whom I thought to be homeless Chad, but is actually Apollo, might be my father. Apparently, I'm not entirely human. I don't know what the fuck is going on. But anyway, the Southwest Wing. Apollo said it doesn't exist, which doesn't make any sense considering I've been to it. He also said despite designing the building and owning it, he's never heard of such a thing. So I've decided to try to find the Southwest Wing again. First, I thought maybe it showed up when you wanted it to. Then I immediately ruled that out, since I wasn't looking for it the first time I encountered it. I began to think that maybe I would get to it if I was caught off guard. So I began wandering around the hallways. Then I realized that I was looking for it. Then, after multiple shifts of rushing around, I was never caught off guard by the mysterious wing. I was getting used to the weirdness and even making friends with some of the patients and employees. I still don't trust Mark though. He gives me a weird feeling. But otherwise, I'm really enjoying the job. It's quite interesting. I clocked out for the night and went back to my apartment. Then I had an idea. If apparently the hospital is mainly for Greek myths and legends, why shouldn't Greek mythology help me figure out the Southwest Wing. So I decided to stay up late and brush up on my Greek myths. The only thing was, only some of the stuff I'd seen could be explained in myths. The rest of the weird occurrences were just horrific and strange, like something out of a horror movie. Apollo did say it was a hospital for all things weird. And I guess that also meant shit that couldn't even be explained with fairy tales. I found one myth that could explain the Southwest Wing. To start, the Southwest Wing had a few defining characteristics that I'd noticed during my encounter. It was confusing. It seemed to be constantly be changing as if to keep me from getting out. Time was warped and distorted. It felt like I was in there for at least 30 minutes, but the clock said no time passed. It also made me feel really uneasy which was strange considering the fact that I'd desensitized to most gore and horror. The Southwest Wing was the first thing in a while that made me genuinely queasy. It also was hard to find and was presumed to not exist, apparently. Three out of the four things can be explained by the myth of Daedalus's labyrinth. The labyrinth constantly changes. Time is distorted. It's hard to find and hard to escape. It also contained horrifying monsters and traps. Fun. I delved deeper into the myth and tried to find ways to locate the labyrinth. If that's even what the Southwest Wing is. So the next day, I decided to start searching for the symbol, the Greek letter Delta, as I went about my work day. Also, about the perception inhibitors, the pens and the coffee, I just recently hypothesized about coffee, since we're always forced to finish it. I left my pen on my desk, and I skipped coffee. Big mistake. Turns out, inhibitor or not, I was still able to see through the mist. According to Apollo, I'm a demigod. So I basically stayed up until 3am reading fairy tales, and then skipped out on caffeine for no reason. I wandered around, already drowsy, when I came across a bulletin board with a bunch of flyers on it. One of the flyers was just a triangle. Delta. I grabbed the flyer and immediately the wall in front of me disappeared. I was in the southwest wing. I would have done a happy dance if I wasn't about to piss myself from nerves. I turned around and the hallway I came in through was nowhere. It was just the endless southwest wing and I was absolutely terrified and unprepared. The only choice I had was to go onward. One thing I've noticed is that the wing doesn't get too creepy until you've been walking for at least 10 minutes. Then you start hearing things. And the doors once again have heavy duty locks and it smells and it induces paranoia. Lots of fun stuff. 
It also killed me to not know what was behind those doors or what was going on in the rooms. It was almost like it was tailored to be my own personal psychological hell of unknowing. I walked for about 10 more minutes and then I began to feel my head spin as my vision turned black and I lost consciousness and collapsed. Due to my own stupidity and poor choices, I passed out from exhaustion in the middle of a possibly malicious labyrinth. As I began to come to, I heard voices and murmurs. Specimen is an adult female, about 29, height 5'4", weight 125 pounds, athletic build, blonde hair, blue eyes. They were describing me. I felt one of them tug my ID tag off my breast pocket. Dr. Maxine Wilson, internal medicine and general surgery. Well then what's she doing here? I don't know. I probably wandered in by accident. How does a mortal wander into here by accident? I don't know, boss. I... Maybe she's not normal? The voice sounded slightly scared. Well then figure it out. I opened my eyes for a brief second and then shut them quickly again upon realisation of where I was. I was in one of the exam rooms. I heard the door slam as both of the voices started to bicker down the hallway and I decided that the coast was clear for me to look around. I opened my eyes and sat up. The room looked to be an OR. There were all kinds of tools and probes lined up on a table next to me. I hope that they didn't use any of those on me yet. I was still dressed in my scrubs and lab coat, which was a good sign that they didn't get to probing my asshole at least. I'd been in OR before. This one was unsettling. Mainly because I wasn't alone, though I initially thought I was. I had falsely thought that everyone had left, except there was one guy that I missed, who was standing in the corner with his arms folded. He looked like he was part bull. He also looked like he'd be named Brutus, but who am I to determine that? Bruton snorted and glared in my direction. I nearly shit myself. Hey buddy, what's up? I asked, making my best attempt to be friendly. All of a sudden, he picked up a syringe with his large, oafish hands and began to fill it. The solution wasn't something I'd seen before, but I knew it couldn't be good. He lunged towards me with the needle. My heart started pounding as I tried to jump off the exam table, but something tugged my arm and shot pain down it, preventing my escape. I looked at my forearm and sighed. Really? They gave me an IV? I was passed out for probably 10 minutes at the most. And this was kind of a huge inconvenience right now. I ripped it out as carefully as I could and bolted towards the door, Brutus still lumbering closer. I fiddled with the door handle, but it was locked. Seriously, what kind of psycho locks a room from the outside? Brutus was almost close enough to grab me and literally had my back against a wall. My last option was to defend myself. I was scrambling around to try and find a last resort weapon to defend myself with, when my eyes were drawn to the fire extinguisher. I tried to open the cabinet that housed the fire extinguisher, but it too was locked. Seriously, who the fuck locks up a fire extinguisher? I used my elbow to smash through the glass, then I grabbed the fire extinguisher and hoisted it above my head, bringing it down on Brutus. He crumpled to the ground in front of me, and looked to still be alive. I tossed the fire extinguisher to the side as an escape idea clicked into my head. I jogged over to the door to the observation room and crossed my fingers as I reached for the doorknob. Surprisingly, it was unlocked. But what was inside was terrifying. Do any of you recall my first entry? I mentioned the creature that was just a torso with a bunch of arms. Well, this observation room looked to be the office of a psychopath. I've seen some pretty gruesome shit, so when I say I audibly gasped upon seeing this room, you can assume it's pretty horrible. There were bulletin boards lining the walls, even covering the one-way glass, each one filled with rows upon rows of pictures of the befores and after of horrifically deformed creatures and people. Upon scanning the boards up and down, I discovered that the board was called the Wall of Successes. Each picture was labelled with an ID number. In what way were these successes? I was beginning to feel sick. 
Upon looking further, I discovered that some of the pictures were of patients I'd treated before, now massacred beyond recognition. I thought I was going to throw up. I stumbled back, partially out of nausea and partially out of shock, and I bumped into a filing cabinet, which promptly toppled over with a crash. I froze, paying no one would catch me in here. I took a deep breath after a few seconds, but my heart was still pounding. When the filing cabinet fell, the contents of one of the drawers spilled out. Piles upon piles of case reports. I cautiously picked one up and looked through it. Classified under the protection of Redacted. Experiment report number 133. The Man Spider. Specimen appears to be functioning properly after reconstruction. The arms from Redacted, Redacted, Redacted and Redacted seem to be working well together. I flipped through more of the pages and I was terrified. To sum it up, whoever this belonged to had kidnapped five humans from the hospital, trapped them in this wing, chopped them up and put everything back together in some horrific conglomeration of body parts. Upon seeing the pictures from this particular report, I actually threw up in my mouth. Then, I heard voices approaching. I froze in my tracks when I heard the voices. Maybe they wouldn't come in here. Maybe I'd have time to figure something out. I set the file folder down and began to scan the room for a possible exit. No doors, no windows, I'm screwed. I saw two blurry figures through the smudged and dusty observation window. I knew I shouldn't have let that beast in charge, a nasal sounding voice said. The figures approached the door and I froze as the handle turned and the door swung open. A ferrety looking guy walked in. He looked a few older than I, with a head of greasy graying black hair and thin wireframe glasses accenting his beady looking eyes. His nose was small and pointed in the air and he was dressed like a nerd. Sweater vest, bow tie, pocket protector, khakis. He looked like he'd be the kind of guy that boasts about his genius IQ, when in reality, he's mediocre. I'm pretty sure I beat him up in high school for being a pretentious fuck. The other guy with him was another minotaur, a bigger one. He looked like Boris. The ferret man spoke. Ah, Dr. Wilson, I see you found my archive. Do you like it? He said, spreading his arms. Yeah, it's very pleasant, I said sarcastically. I see you've taken out my minion, he said, his face beginning to look very punchable. I've also heard your former classmates at MIT that you're a pretty gifted engineer too. You could help me, he said with a devilish smile. It's quite the shame you decided to go into medicine. What could have worked together? Who are you? How do you know? I began to speak, but he cut me off. Hush, mortal. I know things. Yeah, creepy stalker things. Like I asked before, who are you? What is this place and what are you doing? Oh, how rude of me. Allow me to introduce myself, he bowed. Dr. Brandon O'Neill, but my colleagues call me the Sawbone. He smirked again. Okay, Brandon, what are you doing here? It's not Brandon. Well, it is, but, but it's not, whatever. Okay, Mr. Sawbone, I mocked. What are you doing here? He scoffed. Well, you see, when I was a very young boy, I found out I was a demigod. My father is Hephaestus, god of metalworking, tools and fire, he smirked. Great, now I had him monologuing. I met with a group of other demigods who all had special talents relating to their godly parents. We all started talking, and I decided to test my hand in building something to prove my parentage. I nodded. But turns out, I sucked. I sucked at mechanics. I was horrific when it came to engineering, and I couldn't build a fucking birdhouse to save my life. The other demigods made a mockery of me, constantly doubting my legitimacy. I folded my arms. Until one day, I found a dog on the side of the road. It had gotten hit by a car and its leg was broken. I decided to help it and I was able to repair its leg. 
I watched it run out of my workshop happily. It was that day I discovered that I worked better with organic materials, he said, spreading his arms to showcase the board of pictures. You know these other demigods I mentioned? I nodded. I rebuilt them, he said with a devilish grin. This guy was a total psycho. I began to inch my way towards the door, trying to make my escape. He began to pace all around the room, still shaking. There goes my escape. And then I utilized the confusing magic of Daedalus's labyrinth to build this wing, in which my creations can flourish, he paused. Do you fear me now, mortal? If I'm being honest, I can't really be intimidated by someone named Brandon. Sorry, dude, I said. Well, you will come to fear me. The sawbone, he smiled wider. Okay, I said skeptically, trying to nudge my way out the door again. I didn't fear him, but I was entirely unsettled and disturbed by his way of thinking. It worried me what he might do to me, although he was a bit of a weak excuse for a villain. That fool Apollo still doesn't even know, he chuckled under his breath. I mean, he has an idea. God damn it. I made another huge mistake when I said this, because I never should have. I should have just kept my damn mouth shut. I could have escaped if I'd just let him indulge in his delusion of grandeur, but alas, I was a fool. His eyes lit up with more malicious joy as he turned to look at me. You've met Apollo? I tried to play dumb. Who's Apollo? You're lying. You're not really mortal, are you? He pressed. What are you? Nature spirit? Cloud nymph? His eyes widened. How did I not realise before? He tossed. I'd recognise that hair anywhere. You're Apollo's spawn, aren't you? Another demigod, he snarled. My heart was pounding and I felt my hands starting to shake. I needed to find a way out. Suddenly, he opened his arms in a welcoming position. Well, why didn't you say so sooner, he said. Come on, let's take a little tour, why don't we? He smiled that devilish grin again. I'll pass. I have a surgery I have to get to. No, darling, I insist. Time is distorted here, he said joyfully. The level of fake in his tone of voice almost rivaled that of the mean girls that can be found at almost any school. I was impressed and also terrified because I could tell he was going to try and pull something. I could have just decked him and ran for it. But the Minotaur was a limiting factor, as was the unpredictable layout of the labyrinth. My only choice was to follow him. He led me down corridors, pointing out things along the way, like this is the holding room, this is the operating room, this is spare parts storage, until we came to a corridor of large cages. And this is where the finished products are held, he exclaimed. Up and down the rows of cages were hundreds of grossly mutilated monsters. A woman with snakes for arms and legs. A satyr whose bottom half was replaced with another satyr's top half. A creature similar to man spider, but had all legs instead of all arms. It was terrifying and impeccably sad. As we passed the cages, one of the women, her legs were a horse's, came up to the bars of the cage and gestured towards me. I scooted closer and touched the bars. Help us, she gurgled, sounding and looking malnourished and sick. I reached a shaky hand through the bars and touched hers. I'll try, I whispered, looking in her eyes. I could sense the pain and dread emanating from the people and creatures trapped here, like pigs in a slaughterhouse, who know their inevitable doom. Except pigs in a slaughterhouse have their suffering ended. The Sawbones creations don't. They have to continue living after being massacred by a maniac. I had to do something. Sorry this entry is a few days late. I had to figure out how to put it into words. Now, as I'd mentioned a few days ago, I was being taken now on a tour of the Sawbones wing of the hospital by a dork named Brandon with a god complex, among many other suspected neurological issues. To sum it up, this guy was absolutely batshit insane. 
Combine General Zaroff from the most dangerous game with any pretentious dick from your school and then make him 10 times worse and even more twisted. That's this guy. It was disgusting. His creations were people and creatures that were disassembled piece by piece, then forged back together by the hands of a surgical maniac. They were sentient beings. They had feelings and lives and families. And now they were mutilated beyond recognition and locked up in cages for the amusement of a psychopath. The smell was horrific on top of everything else. He never cleaned the cages. Feces and urine lined the floor, the smell permeating the entire hall. Despite how messed up it was, I must admit, he was good. Like, horrifyingly good. No matter how grotesque his creations were, they looked frighteningly natural. Minimal to no scarring, despite being mutilated. Full function of all limbs, no matter where they were placed or what they were replaced with. His surgical skills were impeccable, rivaling the work of some of the best doctors I've worked with. It was terrifying. And I can advocate because he forced me to watch him. Come here then, Miss Wilson. I have something else to show you. He turned around and smiled devilishly. Seriously, what kind of freak unironically says come hither? Anyway, he said this as I was interacting with the patients. I'm pretty good at reading people, and I'm pretty sure he noticed. I turned around to look at him. Come on, darling, no need to be afraid. I would never harm a fellow demigod, he lied, beckoning me toward him. I continued to follow him. And this, he spread his arms wide dramatically, gesturing towards large double doors, is my workshop. His workshop was a large OR. And today's your lucky day, because you get to see my demonstration. Fantastic, I groaned. I was really getting irked by this guy, and I needed to do something. What would he do to me if I tried? Follow me right this way, he grinned again. No need to sanitize, hon. I'll be doing all the work. Just stay behind the yellow line. I'd hate to have anything splattered all over your lab coat. It's quite frustrating, he said, as he ushered me through the scrub room and led me to a corner. He went back in and shut the door behind him. You may be wondering, why didn't she take this chance to escape? He came out a few seconds later, obliterating my chance. He had ditched the high school geek set up for classic blue surgical garb and walked over to the table. Augustus, bring me my supplies, he called. Another minotaur came through the double doors, wheeling a gurney with two people on it. They were both unconscious and strapped to it. You will now witness the talent of the sawbone. He glanced at me. Any suggestions? How about human centipede style? Oh, or arms for legs. Great idea, he pointed at me. I didn't say anything. He was praising himself. I watched in a combination of awe and horror as he hacked his patients into pieces and meticulously pieced them back together. His hands worked quickly and neatly, his nimble fingers trying off every stitch with absolutely no struggle. The end result was horrific. He had fused the one man's mouth to the other man's anus, human centipede style. He'd swapped the positions of Armand's legs creating the most terrifying and disturbing image I've ever seen in my life. He finished cleaning up his tools and then pulled down his mask and looked in my direction. What do you think, fellow demigod? At this point, I snapped out of my awe-induced catatonia and dropped to my knees, dry heaving my lungs out to the point where my eyes watered and my throat stung. I could feel my body shuddering worse than after even the goriest of trauma surgeries with every heave, and I felt incredibly nauseous. It was the worst thing I've ever witnessed. And Dr. Brandon O'Neill went through with it with his joyful grin, never leaving his face. What's wrong, doctor? Can a fellow surgeon not handle a little gore? He asked me, condescendingly. You have no right to call yourself a doctor, I said in between coughs. Why not? I have my ND, he grinned wider, folding his arms across his blood-stained gown. Surely you're desensitized by now. Are you still soft, he pressed. I can handle gore caused by trauma. 
Not intentional mutilation, I said as I stood up, shaking. Ah, still soft, I see. Try to dial down the emotions, maybe. Then, I acted on impulse. I balled my fist and brought it to me right under his nose. He whirled around, hit the floor, and passed out cold. Well, so I thought. He was laughing. He pulled himself off the ground, laughing. He wiped blood from his nose and stood up to face me again. Surely that's not the best you can do, he continued to laugh. Take her away, he waved to his minotaur assistant. I tried to run, but the minotaur had me locked in his arms. I felt a needle go into my neck and I slowly faded out of consciousness. You okay? I heard a voice come in the door. I looked up. It was Mark. Never during my whole job here I seen Dr. Wilson cry. And you saw the demigod stuff, hey? He smirked. It's a lot more than that. What? I asked him. I knew we had more in common than before. Allow me to reintroduce myself. Dr. Mark Smith, son of Asclepius. He held out his hand. I shook it. It's a generic name for a son of such a specialised god. I sniffed back my tears to smirk. I wasn't surprised by his identity. I knew something was off about him since I met him. He nodded. I decided to ask if he'd seen the same stuff as me. Have you ever been to the Southwest Wing? I asked. His smirk faded away. What? He said softly. I guess not then. Ever heard of a guy who calls himself the Sawbone? His facial expression got even darker. I didn't think he was still alive. What? He sat down in a chair across from mine. Years ago I... He sighed. I worked with Dr. O'Neill before he went insane. Really? Yeah. He was one of my buddies from high school. When we graduated college, he asked if I wanted to be a part of a project. I accepted. I was eager to work with on this with him. He described it as revolutionary. I nodded. When he brought in the volunteers, I got confused. I thought we were going to be researching prosthetics and stuff, he said. What happened? He started hacking them apart right in front of me. And he wouldn't let me leave even though I was obviously uncomfortable. What he was doing was so wrong. Wait, you're my nephew, I said, interrupting the conversation. What? Never mind. Back to your story. Okay. Anyway, he was laughing maniacally the whole goddamn time. It was terrifying. He wasn't the Brandon I used to know. I'd never seen this side of him. So what did you do? Nothing. He ended up blowing himself up in some crazy experiment. My eyes widened in shock. I watched him die, Max. The room fell into an awkward silence, to the point where you could hear a pin drop. You know how in the movies they have those scenes where the character reveals a big secret? It felt like one of those. Well, he's obviously still alive. Was there any way he could have survived? Mark shook his head solemnly. No, there were pieces of him everywhere. There was no way. Intriguing. Well, I know I'm new to all this magic stuff, but is there a way he could have, I don't know, been resurrected? Mark shrugged. It'd be extremely hard. I think we should tell Apollo, I suggested. Mark thought for a few seconds before agreeing with me. We both stayed for night shift that night and then ascended the spiral staircase to the fourth floor, Apollo's floor. The only thing was, Apollo wasn't there. I sighed. Where is he? Maybe Olympus? Mark gestured towards the staircase and pointed upward. I really don't want to climb all those, I whined. Watch him not even be there. Even if he isn't, there's other helpful gods. Whatever. I guess it's worth it if we do something about the sawbone, I sighed, beginning to climb the stairs. About an hour and 200 stairs later, we got off at the top of the staircase. The landing was remarkably ornate and gorgeously designed, with marble and gold accenting every structure. I felt incredibly out of place. We approached a set of large gilded double doors, considering the fact that they were the only thing in sight that would be a possible entrance to Olympus. 
I knocked. The doors opened. The room widened into a grand hall, with twelve thrones lining the walls. Each throne was occupied by a god. What mortal dares enter Olympus, a voice boomed. I waved. Zeus, dude, chill out, it's just my kid, Apollo said. And some other dude. What's up? We explained the whole situation to him. Unfortunately, Hephaestus isn't here right now, so I'll have to talk some sense into him. All right, but I'll need your help to get the wing. Okay. We made our way back down the staircase, discussing plans the whole time. I told Apollo and Mark about the labyrinth and how the delta symbol marked the entrance. Oh, so like this, Mark said, picking a flyer off of a bulletin board. It was the same flyer I had found earlier, the one that was just a triangle. That was easy, Apollo said. As soon as the wall disappeared, we began walking. The wing had completely changed, almost as if it were alive, and actively trying to keep us from getting to our destination, if we even had one. We were walking for a few minutes when the corridor started getting eerie. Someone was following us. Well, well, well. So you've brought your friends this time? Doctor? Growled a voice behind us. Guess who? The sawbones spread his arms wide dramatically and sneered. Brought more people to witness my talents? Or possibly more subjects? Your father is very disappointed in you, Apollo said crossing his muscular arms. Why would he be disappointed? After all, he gave me my talents, he smirked. Miss Wilson, I assume you enjoyed my show so much that you wanted to show it to your friends. Well, come on, let's have some fun. He led us down the hallway once again. Everyone was silent as we followed him, tuning out his despicable monologuing. I wondered if Apollo had a plan. He probably didn't. The sawbone led us further until we finally arrived at his workshop. Ta-da, he sang, showcasing the room to us as the doors opened. Now, darlings, just keep behind the yellow line. Miss Wilson can advocate that it gets pretty messy, he snickered. I started feeling sick again. The sawbone called for his assistant again, but this time it wasn't a minotaur. The guy shuffled in uncomfortably, pushing the gurney with the specimens. The sawbones started laughing maniacally and asking for suggestions again. Then, faster than light, Apollo lunged towards the sawbone and grabbed him by the neck. You will not do this to mortals, or anything for that matter. I am the god Apollo, owner of this hospital, and I forbid it. You've done too much, and the Olympian Council has warranted for your arrest. Dead or alive. The sawbone smirked. Yeah, right. Then I watched in horror as Apollo snapped his neck, effortlessly. I heard the sickening crunch, and the sawbone crumpled to the floor, still wearing his devilish grin. He was dead. What? I began to ask. Suddenly, the sawbone sat up, and his head swiveled around to look at us. You don't think I'd modify myself too, foolish demigod. I woke up in a cell. My immediate thought was, what had he done to me? After examining myself, the answer was nothing. I was still intact, which I was surprised and relieved by. I sat up and noticed Brandon standing at the door to my cell, watching me. How long had he been standing there? Are you still sure you don't remember me? He snarled as soon as I noticed him. What? I sputtered. The reason I knew where you went to college wasn't because I talked to people who knew you. It was because I went there too. I was in your classes. Sorry, dude. Doesn't ring a bell, I yawned. Seriously? I was in all of your classes. Brandon O'Neill? Nope. Well, I thought maybe you would remember me, since you always had it out for me, he snarled again. I don't even know who you are. Surprising, he always made the effort to humiliate me. I looked at him like he was crazy, which he was. Like I said, I don't even know you. Well, whether it was intentional or not, 
you always had it out for me. Whenever I thought I did something good, you had to one-up me. I just stood up to face him through the bars. Oh, Wilson is so smart. Her projects and test scores are exceptional, where? He said in a mocking tone. I looked at him like he was crazy again. The professors always used your work as examples. They always called on you and praised you for being a genius. And I was scum. And you've held this against me for eight years? That's sad. You made me look like an idiot, Wilson. And coincidentally, I've gotten my chance to get back at you. The Grey Sisters told me I'd meet someone from my past. who knew it would be my greatest foe. How pleasantly fitting, he grinned. Well, I see you haven't grown up, Sawbone. I said its nickname with finger quotes. And you're locked in a cell by my hand. Actually, it was your guard. Gods, just shut up already, he snapped. I'm going to think of something to do to you and you will suffer. Okay, I said, widening my eyes and mocking his cockiness with hand signs. He stomped his foot and stormed away. I might not have made it seem like it, but I was terrified. I thought I was going to shit my pants and my adrenaline was going crazy. I had to keep my cool though. I sat against the back wall of my cell and let out a sigh, taking shaky deep breaths to try to compose myself. Maybe I could get out of here. I'm surprised you've lasted this long without giving up, said a voice next to me. I looked over. The voice came from the cell next to me. I couldn't see who it was due to the wall between us, but I could hear them. Well, what else am I supposed to do? I replied. Silence. Get out while you still have that spirit. Are you one of his, you know? Yes. My name was Kate. He calls me, never mind. I could sense the fear in her voice. My name's Dr. Maxine Wilson, but call me Max. Anyway, Kate, how did you end up here? Silence. I had just finished getting stitches in my hand. They discharged me. I couldn't find the exit. Then Sawbone found me, and she didn't finish the sentence. I'm a monster, I heard her say softly. Please leave. I don't want you to end up this way. I'm going to try. I'll get you out of here too. What kind of doctor are you? General and trauma surgeon, but I also work in internal medicine. Are you good? I guess, she sighed. Would you be able to fix me? Silence. I, I don't know. I ran my hand through my hair. Max? Yeah. I can help you. Really? Yeah. Silence. Do you have anything long and skinny, like a hairpin? She asked. No, I'm sorry. I have something that I snatched off of one of the Sawbones papers as he walked by. I heard the sound of something slide across the tile floor and I saw it a few inches from my cell. A paper clip. Do you know how to pick a lock? I reflected back on the time I figured it out in order to pull a prank on my old roommate. Yes. Yes, I do. Good. I reached my hand through the bars of my cell and struggled to reach the paper clip. I ended up stretching my whole arm through the bars in order to grab it. I got it. I fiddled with the lock for a few minutes and finally the door swung open. I faced Kate's cell. Kate, I called. She was turned around and I couldn't see her. Do you want me to help you out? No. Go. Why not? She turned to face me. Her face was beautiful, but her body was nearly indescribable and caught me off guard. Her torso was furry and she had four legs, four human legs. Her eyes were puffy with tears. Go, I have nothing left. Leave me. Kate, I started. No, leave me. Don't waste your life. Get out. Silence. Thank you. I said softly. The entire wing was silent. I stopped at a few cells to attempt to unlock them and free the creations inside, but none of them let me. They were broken. A pang of guilt shuddered through me. There was nothing I could do. I felt helpless. 
None of the creations wanted to leave. They had nothing left. They felt like monsters. If I couldn't save the last ones, I had to at least try to save the future ones. The only thing I could think to do was to get out of this wing, maybe find Apollo and stop this psycho completely. But how? I ended up here because I was looking for it. Maybe I could get out by looking for the hospital. After what felt like hours of wandering around aimlessly, my heart jumping out of my chest every time I heard my shoe squeak in fear that I might be caught, I found myself back in the hospital. It was busy as usual. Someone tapped me on the shoulder and I noticed I was spacing out. Are you alright? I snapped out of my daze. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I thought about Kate. I thought about the other creations. I thought about how they wouldn't let me help them. I had to excuse myself to the break room where I sat in the corner and cried, my body still shuddering with every breath. I had to do something. I was just unsure of what. The Sawbones smiled at us and cocked his head to the side. It was impossible. I watched him die. I heard his neck crack. I watched his eyes roll back in his head. But here he is again, taunting us. I have a lot more to offer than you might think, he said. His clothing store as his arms and legs lengthened and his fingers became claws. We ran. I was in front, Apollo was behind me, and Mark was behind Apollo. I have never ran so fast in my life. My heart was pounding out of my chest with another adrenaline rush, and I didn't have a plan, except to run. We heard the maniacal cackling of the monster as he followed us. I led Apollo and Mark around corners, through hallways, and everywhere you could go in a bland hospital wing to try to get away. It was hopeless. The Sorbo knew the place and we didn't. His grotesque claws kept reaching for us, narrowly missing each time. Until they didn't. Help! I heard a scream as the monster picked up Mark and brought him close to its face. It licked its gleaming white teeth, which were now hideously curved and razor sharp. Where do you think you're going? It snarled. Help! Mark whimpered. I'll get you down! I yelled. No, you won't, the monster snarled, biting into Mark. His scream was horrific and blood-curdling. It sent a shiver up my spine, and my heart felt like it was collapsing. Apollo looked on in shock and pulled a sword out of seemingly nowhere. Mark continued to scream in pain as Apollo lunged towards the monster and sliced one of its legs. The monster reared up and squealed in pain, dropping Mark onto the ground in front of us before retreating. I ran over to Mark, followed by Apollo. He was still alive. His body was mangled in the spots where the monster had sunk its teeth, to the point where there was blood everywhere and its muscle tissue and organs were visible. The monster had taken a whole chunk of him. I don't want to die. I don't want to die, please. Not like this, he pleaded. Just don't look at it. You... I wanted to say you're going to be okay, but... I didn't want to lie to him. I didn't know. There was nothing I could do. He was too far past any type of treatment. I felt helpless. Please, please, I don't want to die. I held his hand and looked into his eyes. I couldn't think of anything to say. Please. I looked over and even Apollo, the god of healing, hung his head. Mark looked at me again, his eyes now filled with tears. Pain and fear accenting every word. Please, I don't want to... I was still speechless as he took his last breath. There was nothing we could do. Come on, Apollo said solemnly. I was too shocked to even cry. The monster had killed one of my friends, and I didn't know how to react. I got up. Yeah, I said shakily. Apollo and I walked for a few minutes in silence, too shocked to say anything. We were both on high alert, considering the sawbone monster could spring on us at any moment. The labyrinth continued to twist and wind and change as we walked through it, like it was alive. 
Why couldn't you do anything? I asked softly. Apollo was silent. Not as powerful as you think, he said. So what do we do? Kill it. But how? Silence. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, said a voice. Normal Brandon turned to the corner. The one that I had just watched die, and then turn into a monster, and then kill my friend, was standing right in front of us. We can start the real fun. No, I said. Why not? He looked surprised. You're a monster. I know. Your point? I clenched my fists. I needed to think of something to do. I had a little god on my side, and yet I still had no plan. I decided to turn the tables and have some fun. You know, maybe we could have some fun. I'm really interested in how you modified yourself. Do you have a case report that I can read? His eyes widened and brightened. Ding had found his fatal flaw. Of course, he said excitedly. Apollo shot me a look and said, what are you thinking? I winked at him. Follow me, he seemed genuinely excited. If there was one thing that this guy couldn't resist, it was a chance to show off. So I used that. He brought me back to the office that I initially woke up in and excitedly showed me his files. He made Apollo stand outside while I looked through the file. Finally, you've taken an interest in my work. I read the comprehensive case report of how he had modified himself and I'm quite thankful that he was so good at documenting. I closed the report and thanked him. He surprisingly let me go. Be careful what you do, demigod, he said right before I left, his mouth curling to that smile again. Except his teeth were razor sharp. I caught up to Apollo and explained to him what I saw. I had a plan, except I didn't. I tried to sneak up on him, but I found myself getting tortured over and over again in ways I cannot even describe. I knew how he worked, but even though I was trying my best, he was too hard of an opponent. I vaguely remember getting electrocuted over and over again. I remember him trying to change my mind. I remember the threats, the ridicule, the horror. I remember him trying to pry up my nails. I remember him striking pressure points, rendering me useless. He wasn't just ruthless. He was smart. He wasn't a monster when he tortured me. He was in his normal human form. I could still hear his maniacal laughing. I remember laying on his table, my entire body feeling like it was on fire. I was alone against a monster, a monster with less than pleasant torture techniques, a monster who I had no chance against. My body still aches from the experience. I remember his voice. Oh, you didn't like that? Well, I don't care. The sound reverberated through the room as he pulled down on a lever, sending hundreds of volts of electricity coursing through my body. Over and over and over. How about this? I'll let you go if you can answer this question. I gritted my teeth and grunted in pain. What's two plus two? He was toying with me. I wanted to say four. I knew it was four. However, I couldn't answer him. Looks like you can't answer it. Whoopsies, he said, continuing to laugh and cranking the lever to shock me again. I just wanted it to end, as I listened to his maniacal laughing as he shocked me, for seemingly no reason. You have no chance, he cackled, smiling and laughing like a child. I lifted my head with difficulty, after the seventh shock had subsided. Suddenly, the door flung open. Kate was standing there, and so were most of the other creations that I had recognised from the cells before. She flashed me a pained smile, and I acknowledged her silently. I'm sorry, I mouthed, struggling to breathe. Don't be, she whispered. There was nothing you could do. I won't let him do this to anyone. Hearing her, the sawbone glanced over to the door, and his grin faltered. Impossible! I broke you! I broke you all! Why are you here? He was shrieking at the top of his lungs, throwing a ballistic tantrum. In his anger, he ran over to me and jammed a needle into my arm, and I started to feel woozy, eventually blacking out. My co-workers said that they found me collapsed from exhaustion in the hospital's lobby, which is where I woke up. My entire body ached, and I examined myself for injuries. 
only finding some cuts and bruises. Miraculously, no broken bones. I went back to where the labyrinth's entrance was, and it wasn't there. The labyrinth was sealed. As for the sawbone, I can only assume he died, and took the hospital section of the labyrinth with him. As for his creations, I can only wish the best for them. I wish I could have done something to help them, and I thank Kate graciously. They saved me. We held a funeral for Mark too, as I felt that he should be honoured. I also haven't seen Apollo since, and I even checked his hangout on the missing fourth floor. He hasn't been there. As for now, I work at a hospital for myths and monsters, and I've seen some freaky shit. All I know is that I have a feeling that the labyrinth isn't truly gone. It's alive. In fact, the whole hospital is alive. I'm going to be honest. My mind and body are both still recovering from the experience. I'll see you guys soon. Something's most definitely bound to happen. Signing off for now, Dr. Wilson. So this probably isn't as scary as most of the stories on this subreddit, but I'll put it in here anyway. I was 16 when this happened. So my mom and I stayed the night at my sister's house. We were staying in a bedroom in the basement. The basement was completely renovated and had windows and a door leading into the backyard, so not very creepy. My mom's sister and her kids were all upstairs eating breakfast while I went to have a shower in the bathroom right next to our room. Everything was fine until I got out and was drying myself off. As I was drying myself off, the light started to lightly flicker, but I didn't think anything of it. I realized I forgot to grab my clothes, so I quickly dried off, wrapped the towel around myself, and went to the door. It didn't open. I figured that I might have locked the door, but just forgot, though I was sure I didn't, and unlocked it and tried to open it. It still didn't open. It was then that the light started to flicker more rapidly, as if someone was quickly hitting the light switch on and off. I started to freak out and desperately tried to open the door, but it wouldn't budge, no matter what I did. The light started to flicker on and off quicker and quicker. I yelled for help and I could hear my mom running down the stairs. But then the light stopped and I was suddenly able to open the door right as my mom was rounding the corner to enter the hallway. When I told my mom and sister, they thought it was so funny. My sister said it was probably the steam making the lights flicker, but that doesn't explain why the door wouldn't open no matter which way I turned the lock. The whole incident from when the lights started rapidly flickering to when I was able to open the door probably lasted 25 to 30 seconds. Okay, hey again. So this is one of my childhood stories my mom told me of the demon named the sloth. So I was around four to five years old and I have a twin sister, but we moved into a new house for the first month. All things are quite simple. After a month, me and my sister randomly would talk to our mom about the man in the bedroom window. The thing is, I was in one window, not a window I can even reach or look out while my sister is on the other side of the house. Same issue. Anyway, the ghost was telling us to open the window and let it in, according to what my mom said. Month three, and now me and my sister were terrified of the bedrooms as we kept telling mom he's trying to open the windows himself. Now the problem my mom said with us just seeing things is there was no trees or anything really to make the shadows a branch could do to make us see things. My mom said my sister one night told her the sloth now wants us to leave the house with it. My mom did call the cops to do a check at this point to make sure we weren't being stalked by a crazy person. We even added cameras. Nothing ever appeared. Month five, maybe six, my mom said random loud banging on the front and back door would happen at a random hour. She said she would call the cops, but no one was there. Late month six, my mom said she entered my bedroom to see me praying to God and praying to Jesus like a minister would 
trying to make the man go away. Remember, I was less than six years old at this time, doing a prayer with words I shouldn't even know yet. Month seven, I go up to my mom and tell her the man has long arms and is calling himself the sloth. And my mom said my sister reacted to the sloth coming to my window too. Later in the month, my mom said she looked at her window and saw a shadowy head looking in. My dad was out of town at this time for business, so my mom grabbed us, put us in a closet and called the cops. No one was there on camera, no footprints. Hell, it was snowing now as we entered December and no prints anywhere. My mom called my dad that night and told him her thoughts. So they got the property blessed by the local church. The problems instantly stopped. However, the story isn't over. At this point, I've never heard this story till I believe 2014, maybe 2015. And me and my sister, mom, were watching the show Paranormal Witness. When on that show, they had a medium that came into a place near where we lived. And she said these words. There is a demon in this house. Someone let in years ago and it's called the sloth. At that moment, my mom started freaking out in a way I've never seen her do. Then she paused the video and told us the story. At this point, I'm caught up. My mom refuses to watch it, so I watch it alone to see what they say about it. Well, the sloth demon is a child killer. If you let it into your home, or if not, it may try to lure kids away from the home into traffic or other dangerous situations. So we're planning to try learning and putting the history of the morgues past together, as most of the 150 year old history has been lost. Some pieces were brought to light through the Waverley Hill Sanatorium, connected by the body cart tracks. And some facts were found out of the wreckage of the once morgue's dark past. Me and some friends work at the morgue now, the haunted house during the Halloween season. We're hoping to connect with the spirits that haunt the grounds and hopefully learn some history. As what we do know is the owners went missing without a trace. Bodies were mistreated and left behind to decompose. And that the morgue's history was lost when pieces were destroyed or sold at auction. We know so far of six residential ghosts, nicknames and two identified. The child wanders the halls and plays peekaboo with workers and visitors. The top hat man or the coolest ghost I've ever met, according to the devices we used to communicate with. He did better or actually the best conversation I think any of us have ever had trying this stuff. But anyway, this spirit is a friendly spirit. We identified him in our last hunt as Owen, thanks to a medium. His wife is with him as well. However, we know from what he says, he didn't die at the morgue. The lantern woman. She wanders the graveyard room, furnace room and the slab room with what looks like a lantern you can see. But in two photos, I don't have them. When I go to the second investigation, I'll ask for them. You can see a woman in a white dress. Ironically, the ghost has the simple name Six. We don't have interactions with him or her, but we know it's not a friend. However, we are safe from it. According to the medium and ironically Owen, the ghost was discovered after a medium came through. She walks into a room, can't name the room, and felt uneasy. She asked us to pull up a map for the room and on the map, the walled off section shouldn't have been walked off as it isn't in the blueprints. However, the medium did say that the wall was damaged. Six would be something possibly worse than the next spirit. And lastly, the gremlin. We're not sure of his origin, but he isn't hostile until provoked. You'll know he's near if you smell a skunk or rotten smell. We learned how kind he can be the hard way. We got his name as he scratched the mark of the gremlin into a worker that taunted him two years before I joined. The gremlin doesn't like being spoken to and will watch people in the graveyard, storage and gurney room and he will rarely make an appearance in the body furnace. Yes, the original furnace is still there and is accessible. Actually, workers tend to use it to hide from customers. However, 
The gremlin is known to attack using rocks and other items by throwing. Anti-scratches. We will be doing a new research trip, hopefully getting a hold of Owen again, and this will take place sometime in December.